you, Angie. So welcome everybody to this afternoon's meeting of the Jones Library Building Committee. We are meeting uh, virtually uh, as authorized by the state of Massachusetts. So uh, I'm gonna ask uh, each of you to signify your attendance. And so we make sure that everybody can be heard and can speak. Uh, Christine. Here. Thank you. Sharon. Here. Alex. Here. Paul Bockelman. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. It's nice to see you, Anika. George. Here. Nice to see you, George. Sean. Here. Nice to see you, Sean. And I'm Austin Sarrett. Okay, we are we are all we are joined today by um, representatives of the uh, owners project uh, management team. Thank you to Ken and to Will for um, for being here. And I thought I saw it there. She is Josephine. We're we're joined by uh, Josephine from FAA. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we have an interesting and important agenda. Uh, this afternoon. There are no minutes of uh, our prior meetings that we have to approve today. We will lay that off uh, to a future date. The next item on the agenda, item three, Sean, is the financial update. Yeah, so uh, two things. Um, we do have one invoice to approve, which is uh, for our um, cost estimator that we um, we just reviewed the cost estimates at the last meeting. So I'll bring that up in one second. Thank you. The other update is that um, at the last meeting, we heard from FAA about the contract. So we have sent them a contract amendment to um, uh, to extend the previous contract so we can go ahead and get them right. paid. So that's in, in their court now and just waiting for their review and, and approval. Great. And I will share my screen real quickly. Thank you, thank just you. Just so you can see the invoice. So this has been reviewed and um, okayed by Collier's, which is this little red recommendation for payment down here. Wow. Um, and we obviously they've performed the work because uh, we also heard the outcome, heard the results last time. Great. So you're looking for a recommendation from the building committee that this invoice be paid. Is that correct, Sean? Correct. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thanks so much. Okay, uh, any discussion of the invoice? All right, Sean, if you would take that down, that's $8,000. I'm gonna go and ask you to signify your approval of paying of the invoice. Sharon Sherry. Yes. Christine. Yes. Alex. Yes. Paul. Yes. Anika. Yes. Thank you, George. Yes. Sean. Yes. And Austin votes yes. Thank you, Sean. Okay, anything else of, of a, on the financial update? Sean? Uh, no, I think that's it. Great, thank, thank you so much. Okay, so um, item four, it says project budget. I think what we wanna do is we wanna talk about recommendations for uh, changes in the design that would reduce somewhat the cost and discuss how to move forward with uh, the revision of the plan. Um, we will also wanna hear in a minute from Kent about the capital campaign as was requested at the last, uh, at the last meeting. Uh, I wanna make sure everybody on the building committee knows that at yesterday's uh, board of trustees meeting of the Jones Library, the trustees voted five to one uh, for a motion that read as follows. Uh, it was moved that we enter into a new agreement with the town of Amherst, pledging the value of the endowment to help fund or to backstop the funding of the Jones Library Building Committee, uh, the Jones Library Building Project. So uh, <laughs> that means that what the trustees in essence did yesterday was to re-pledge the endowment uh, we had pledged up to $6 million roughly of the endowment against fundraising receipts as they came in. And we've uh, already, the town has already gotten $500,000 with more in the offing. 
And what, what the trustees uh, did yesterday was to say, we want to enter into a conversation with the town to see whether we can come to an agreement where we will backstop the fundraising uh, with the value of the endowment, which is now at $8.6 million. And to, in a sense, uh, not count as against that commitment any funds that have already been raised. So this would be an additional commitment beyond what we had pledged before. So that's part of the, I guess, the financial picture. Um, I want, wonder if uh, now uh, we could ask Kent to come into the room. Angie, if you can make that happen, or Sharon, if you can make that happen, to hear a report about the capital campaign. There you go, Kent, you're almost unmuted. Try again. And if Sharon could bring in, um, Ginny also I think is on this, um, but why am I not, why are you not seeing my video, start video, okay. Um, there you go, thank, okay, Kent. Thank you very much. Uh, so the campaign uh, organization, let's put it that way, um, has known for some time that it needed to raise more than the amount of the original budget for it. And, but at the same time, it wasn't really free to begin working on this until about February, because it was until that point, uh, the right to appeal uh, the judge's decision that a two thirds majority was not needed, didn't expire. So everything we've been doing, we've been doing since February. And that has been working on about four or five different fronts uh, and in lots of detail that I'd like actually to, uh, let me just summarize quickly. We've been, uh, we've been working on infrastructure. That is, you can't mount a campaign without a whole host of volunteers, without uh, support documents, um, without a plan. Uh, without uh, then beginning to make applications for grants, et cetera. And I know Ginny has a very brief report that I think can fill you in a lot faster than I can. If you could recognize her, uh, that would be good. So are you done with whatever you have to tell yeah, us? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be obviously have to answer a question, but I think we're, this, this is gonna be a lot more into the weeds than uh, I might do in 30 seconds. So yes. Good. I, so you're done with your presentation, Ginny. If you uh, if you want to uh, do whatever it is that Kent is asking you to do, that would be wonderful. I'd be happy to, and um, would actually, if it's possible, to share my screen, Angela. Um, I think I have that opportunity now. Let me get that. You should um, be good to go. Yep. Okay. Excellent. I'll say that. Excellent. So what I want to do, um, and again, Kent, is, uh, Kent knows the details. Um, I'm wanting to give you an overview of where we are with the capital campaign, the infrastructure we put in place, and the progress that we've made to date. And I bring up this schedule that you're all very familiar with, um, particularly those of you from Colliers, um, because the timeline that you've been working all uh, under with regard to the capital project um, mapped to the bottom of this is the capital campaign timeline. And while capital campaigns have their own life cycle, those um, timing is tied to the overall project. So we are finishing the infrastructure phase this summer. Um, entering what is called the quiet campaign, where the goal is to raise at least half of the, um, the monies before entering the public phase of the campaign. So ideally, when you get to the point where construction starts, there's a big public launch, there's an event, there's, um, uh, we're talking to some Amherst uh, connected celebrities to be part of that. Um, and because once there's a big hole in the ground in downtown, once construction is happening, people pay attention. People pay attention differently. And by having the money already raised at least half, donors have the confidence that they're contributing to something that's tangible, something that's really going to happen, something that is happening um, as they go. So our chicken and egg right now is that key components of our fundraising efforts can't start 
until we've reached certain milestones in the building project. So um, we've heard the calls uh, to show the fundraising so that we know we can proceed. And um, you know we're in the position of needing the project to proceed so that we can continue to fundraise. Um, so I want to give you the detail with that background, update you on the numbers and the progress so far, um, because it demonstrates our ability to meet the, the new challenge of the higher numbers. So infrastructure wise, um, you know, our team, um, we couldn't be better uh, off than having Kent and Lee um, leading the way um, with their experience. Um, I have been working part time with the project since March as the paid campaign manager, I, an employee of the Friends. Um, we have consultants involved. We have an 18 member campaign committee and the Friends of the Jones has been working for um, the past half a decade to put the infrastructure in place as an organization, um, knowing that this capital campaign was coming. So we have spent a lot of time on a database, um, on financial systems. The friends are actually doing their first audit um, this year so that we are ready to have that capacity to, um, to be dealing with larger gifts. Um, and we've been working with um, Amherst-based international design firm IdeaCo um, to come up with the brand elements that you see here, um, the look and feel for the campaign, the materials, um, websites, so on and so forth to move forward. Um, we also, um, well, actually, let's go ahead with, with this. Um, here's where we are with our goals Um where we are on track for our original goal is $6.6 .6 million. Uh, we are on track for that. Um, in fact, we're well ahead of schedule. Um, and I know this number has significantly gone up um, and that right now it remains a moving target. I will get to that. But there's um, talking about the original goal here um, matters in terms uh -huh. of our content. Um, so our original target was to reach our 50% point of this goal by May of this next year. Um, as of this month, as of August, we have raised um, commitments of over $3 million, which represents 93% of that initial target. So 93% of the half or 47% of our initial goal. And that's nine months ahead of schedule. And I believe Mr. Ferber got another $50,000 contribution today that is not uh, yeah. um, put in the showing on this, on this chart. Um, so we recognize that this is not enough with this news numbers, but it's making the point regarding our success because this is, an indicator of our capacity um, going forward. Um, here's the detail. Um, in terms of donor commitments to date, you know about the CPA funds, um, the Mass Cultural Facilities Fund, Beverage Foundation, um, thanks to Senator Comerford and, and Representative Dom, we have a um, uh, $50,000 earmark in this um, state budget for FY23. And our community campaign has raised um, almost um, $1.8 million to date. Um, pending right now, um, Congressman McGovern has a $1.1 <clears throat> million earmark in the federal budget. It has made it um, through the Appropriations Committee, so there's no guarantee, but we should be hearing about that by October at the latest. Um, and we are in process with the National Endowment for the Humanities for an Infrastructure Challenge Grant where we're requesting a million dollars for that. None of those were uh, initially in our um, <sighs> sites and in, in the initial 6.6 .6 million. So these are additional. Um, and the other piece you all know about with the historic tax credits, the original funding for that, um, we have projected with the cost estimate, um, you know, those costs go up, then the historic tax credits uh, may go up as well. So. There are plenty of ways to slice and dice this, um, but if you look at what's been committed to date, um, plus the historic tax credits and earmarks would get us just over our total original goal, nine months ahead of schedule, um, in terms of where we were we were hoping to meet our 50% milestone. Um, so just to be very clear, the 3,085,000 is what's committed. Those others, um, until they're, they're um, definite, they're not yet definite. Um, and then looking ahead at opportunities, our, our original plan 
was to go to press on our materials two weeks ago and to start working with donors earlier this month um, targeting that $6.6 .6 million number. Um, we were acknowledging that we knew the price would go mm -hmm. higher, but best practice is you only change your number once. And our intention was to change the number at the end of the bid process when we knew exactly what construction was going to cost. And yet the cost escalations were so significant um, that we've actually put our materials on hold. Um, we've put our outreach, how, outreach efforts on hold so that we can get the new number that we're working with. Um, so when we're looking at it, individual donors, our campaign is on hold to start this fall with our major gifts um, and then launching our community campaign publicly either in May or September of next year with the original plan. Um, we've identified about 15 uh, to 25 area banks and businesses that are good targets um, to likely give, but those are on hold until we have the naming opportunities in the building um, clarified. Um, uh, Rep. Mindy Dom put us in uh, the Massachusetts bond bill that did not pass um, the legislature in July, but there are efforts to revive that, um, and our delegates are prepared to pursue this. Um, and then foundations, as well as sustainability grants, both public and private, there are multiple opportunities um, that we're looking at going with there. Um, to wrap up, um, momentum. <laughs> um, we know that there's broad public support for this campaign and the vision of what we're looking to build. Um, we have been impressed by the state and federal backing that's out there that was not anticipated as being part of our fundraising beyond that initial um, uh, MBLC grant. And with the new climate bill um, and with multiple uh, grants out there available for climate and community building programs, there are opportunities that, that we will pursue. Um, the things we need to remember and that I hope you all, and I know you all know this, um, you know, for fundraising, delays like this interrupt the momentum of our proposal and it erodes confidence from donors that um, the project is moving forward that makes it that much harder to do the fundraising. And of course, delays always increase costs in the work that we're doing. So, so with thanks. that, I will stop and um, happy to take questions or, or uh, allow Kent to do so. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Kent. Thank you for the extraordinary work you've done. Um, uh, the building committee knows full well about some of what it is that you've talked about. We don't need to be told about delays increasing costs. Um, th that's not a fundraising issue directly, though, it, as you point out, it has implications for fundraising. But we're incredibly grateful for the work that you all have done and the success that you've um, already demonstrated. So um, are there any questions about the, um, about the, about the fundraising? Kent, it is clear, uh, is, is it accurate to say that um, uh, you think you can raise uh, at least $6 million more of private funds? Yes. <laughs> I mean, can, do I, they were thinking I can do it. Um, certainly isn't any kind of guarantee, but I think it's plausible. And I think with the, you know, the right team and um, some time, yeah. And can you say anything? Uh, let me, there's one other thing actually, well, possibly that Ginny didn't mention, which has yeah. arisen only in the last couple of weeks, which is that the, the select board and the, the, the state delegation from Deerfield are organizing a effort to persuade the legislators representing all of the libraries around the state, which are at risk to, um, to get the MBLC to recognize what's happening to all these projects that are at risk. There's at least six, and we've been waiting for Sharon to come back to help us identify, because I'm sure there's another six more that while they've accepted the MBLC grant, they're in the position we are, they don't yet have a firm construction contract. So yep. they're at risk. And we think there's some good possibility there. Well, that, that's a project that will be carried forward, I'm sure, enthusiastically by the town manager and the town. But I want to come back to my to yes. the six, $6 million. So I just wonder whether you can say anything other that would, would give some 
make a little more concrete your hope that you can raise six million dollars. I mean, you've done a lot of prospect cultivation. You've done a lot of donor research. This this is not just uh, a, a wish and a prayer. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, I think what you're talking about, what, the way I look at this is, what would it take to raise $14 million instead of 6.6? .6? Yeah. And you go at this with mathematics. And so what would it take to do that? And you know you can start with 1.6, well, two and a half or something like two and a half. There was a question raised in historic tax credits because the $8 million that the original estimate was gonna be spent on the old, the original building is now up to 12 million. And presumably the 20% cap on his tax credits goes up. So that's two and a half million toward what would normally be a $3 million lead gift. Yeah. Um, and if these two $1 million earmarks or any challenge grants begin to fill out the, what is normally the most important part of a gift table, which is the top end. So uh, we also, I mean, I mean it, it, there's a lot of, it, 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 I don't want to uh, disclose anything confidential. Yeah, of course not. But, but there are prospects out there who are talking to us who um, could be very generous. And Great. they haven't been. And uh, so, it, it, I mean, I don't know. It's, it, it, I can share the gift table with you, but it's, um, it's hard to know how to uh, reassure you that, uh, that this is possible. Yeah, well, you've done a great job already in showing the, the enthusiasm and generosity of the community. Are there questions for about the fundraising that you want to ask now? Okay, well, again, with great, great gratitude to Kent and to Ginny, thank you for the presentation. Thank you so much. Oh, um, Ginny, did you wanna ask a question? I, I just wanted to, to clarify based on what you said before, Austin, I'm sorry I wasn't more clear on this. My, my point was that fundraising costs go up as well in addition great. to the other costs that, yep. that you will have. Not, yep. I know you're all very well aware of that. So yep. thank you. Thank you. Again, thanks for the work and thanks for the, thanks for the presentation. Really great. Very helpful. You, you, you don't need us anymore. We need you. We always need you, but I'm not sure that uh, you need I'll to be present. On. No. I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat waiting to hear what else is going to happen. Okay. All right. With Kent on the edge of his seat. So I think now um, would be appropriate to look again at the question of the uh, possible uh, cost savings uh, in the um, in the building, uh, in the building plan, and to, to discuss um, those, uh, and then to talk together about uh, where we are and uh, how we uh, think uh, we should be proceeding. So I don't know whether uh, Ken, you're going to lead us through that, or Sharon, are you going to lead us through? I think Ken will lead, but Ken, I have the spreadsheet. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Please hold. Sounds good. Can you all see that? Uh, it's visible to me. Is everybody good Is with it that? Big enough. Mm, seems to be good. Okay. okay. Great. So what you see here before you right now is our is our standard what we call our value management table that we uh, work through with the design team and with both estimators, it typically happens in the same room at the same time that the estimate reconciliation is going on. We understand that there's could be a potential for cost savings needed or uh, just as a, as a matter of course, we wanna make sure that we're identifying as many things as possible that could potentially save us down the road. So you'll see here, again, we're in the schematic design phase, which is really the first phase of the design. And we've identified a series of items uh, that are noted um, under the description. And then we uh, have the, the trade costs with the total markup under the total with markup, and then the status. So uh, the status is rejected either uh, outright um, by the design team uh, or outright by the, um, uh, by the trustees or outright by other entities that have the ability to be able to say yay or nay on some of these items. So 
as we work through this list, you can see that there are several items that um, are possible that we've identified and that have made it this far that haven't been uh, have been rejected yet. And so those uh, those items are, are noted to be um, the Ares craft in lieu of cast stone. This is again on the exterior of the building. Ares craft is a is a um, a modular precast um, stone piece that's that would be used instead of cast stone. Um, uh, Ares craft in lieu of metal panel on the exterior, and, and those are uh, thirty thousand dollars and one hundred and ten thousand dollars savings uh, accordingly. Um, uh, a fifty percent Ares craft versus metal panel. Uh, that was that was another one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So you can see how these are starting to uh, to add up a little bit up, up to the total. So the elimination of the window sash replacement in the existing building, that's uh, $170,000 savings. Um, some of these items that were that were not, that were rejected, you can see standing seam roof in lieu of the slate, uh, use skylight in lieu of sawtooth roof. So those we thought were, were sacrosanct. And so we wanted again to make sure that those were in the rejected column. Direct uh, decorative metal railing, uh, in the interior of the building now, in lieu of the glass railing, uh, is about $85,000 savings standard operable wall in lieu of nano wall. So nano wall is a uh, transparent uh, glazed demountable partition that cuts basically splits a large room in half. You've seen those sliding partitions. Nano wall is a glazed uh, partition. So we would substitute that out for a standard um, Operating panel, which would be kind of the upholstered, um, have the have the good STC acoustic rating to them, but uh, definitely a step down from the nano wall. Uh, some of the larger items in um, in the interior, ACT, which is acoustical ceiling tile, in lieu of the compound wood ceiling, uh, appears to be about a three hundred thousand dollars savings. ACT acoustical ceiling tile again, in lieu of the plank ceiling, is about fifty five thousand dollars. Uh, the elimination of HVAC and special collections was rejected. That was about a $350,000 savings. And then these next two happen to be an, an either or. So concrete sidewalk in lieu of stone and granite pavers or brick pavers in lieu of stone and granite pavers are a, um, uh, a possible $575,000 or $410,000. We took the larger of the two, the more aggressive of the two based on um, where we're at right now with the budget. And then uh, the last item that we had was the typical uh, CMU, which a CMU is a concrete block, concrete masonry unit, open trash enclosure in lieu of uh, one with siding and a roof uh, on the exterior of the building. And that was about a $32,000 savings. So all told, we are showing about a net uh, savings of 1.5 million. Uh, and this is really, again, um, the large items that are out there are, are, are no longer. We are really scratching the bottom to really try to get as much out of the project as we possibly can without being able to reduce any program. And this is this is the result of that. Okay. Uh, so Ken, could you just go down one second just to the bottom again? You have something called markup percentage 10% and I'm not sure what that figure is and what it's referring to. So the standard markups that we've put in place um, refer to the general conditions, general requirements of the general contractor, things of that their profit and overhead. So those are included and we're assuming about a 10% markup and those are included in those okay. um, costs. Great, thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so before going further, and there is more to say, uh, questions about this, this set of proposed uh, changes to the building. Paul. Can you clarify the status? Who actually made the decisions uh, at this point? I, I assume these are ultimately a building committee decision, um, but in terms of rejected or possible where, where those decisions were made, or is that, yeah, just where those decisions were made? Yeah, so Craig would be able to talk more to that than I could, Paul, uh, but I, I'm assuming that like the CLT was a decision made by the Sustainability Committee that that's, you know, again, those are um, some of the ECMs, the, the skylight in, in lieu of the sawtooth uh, that may have been 
um, a combination of the design subcommittee and the design team based on the fact that it's um, a very striking design element of the building. And um, that's, may, that's I just may, may I just interrupt? Paul, I think that's a very good question. I think nothing has been rejected. So uh, I think that the jurisdiction is in this in the building committee. I think that what is meant by rejected is these seem not to be the most desirable or the most plausible cuts. But your question, as I understand it, is uh, I, sh I share the, the energy behind the question, which is if we if the building committee were to say we want to you know, substitute steel for the cross laminated timber, I, that's within our jurisdiction. But I think what was done with this is that uh, changes that seem to be either not plausible in the sense of given what we had already committed to, or changes that would diminish in some sense what we took to be the most important design elements of the library, they're in the rejected uh, column. But uh, all of that can be um, can be changed. Is that did that answer your question? Yeah, that, that's helpful. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that you know these are recommendations to the building committee. Is what I'm I'm seeing this as. That's correct. Yep. Great. Correct. Thank you, yeah. George. Um, yeah, I just wanted a clarification on item six: the eliminate window sash replacement. Um, if we did do that, does that mean that the existing sashes would be renovated or would they be left as is? I believe, George, it would meet, they would be repaired. Okay. So that would, it would be, uh, that would be taken care of. Yeah, we wouldn't leave them as is. Again, just to be clear, Ken, when you say you believe, meaning there's money in the budget for right. the repair. So That's it's correct. not, it's not a belief, it's a plan. Right, we would plan yep. to to replace. Okay, great. Terrific. Other questions? Yeah, Alex. Yeah, I just had a quick question. Um, in the and I didn't notice this yesterday. Sorry. In um, what's item number? I guess three and four, where it says Aeroscraft in lieu of cast stone, which I assume is the Centria option we looked at, and then Aeroscraft in lieu of metal panel. Um, those are I. The, the metal panel is something that we rejected. I don't think there's any met, metal panel that I'm aware of. So I'm just, I'm not entirely understanding what that. Josephine, do you have anything on that? Yeah, um, I can say that we have some metal panel that was residing on some areas of the building, but there were small portions. And I'm not sure if that's what that line item is there for, Ken. We had um, a pop out on the north um, facade um, and that was shown as metal and then um, we had some you know pop outs at the dormers and also some of the rooftop elements like the um, elevator head house um, were metal panels. Great thank you for the clarification. Okay other questions about this? Yeah Anika. Thank you so would there be any um, known uh, programmatic changes caused by the um, the cuts? No, so that was one of the things that there were no programmatic changes, I don't believe, from any of these cuts. These are purely aesthetic changes as, as, as it stands right now. Ken, could you um, just, uh, in the spirit of the question that was asked earlier, at the bottom, triple, triple pane window glazing, uh, it says, uh, if I can read it, alternate, and window overhang alternate. So can you explain what the category alternate means? Sure. So what will happen is the design team will design essentially two items. One will be the standard double pane glazing, and then there will be an add alternate for, or a deduct alternate to go from triple pane to double pane, or go from double pane to triple pane. That'll be noted within the design documents and the contractors will bid that alternate separately. If we get favorable bids, then we can accept that alternate and incorporate that into the, into the, uh, into the plans. So does that mean that there's a potential for another um, million dollars or more in savings? 
Ken? Do you eliminate both of those? Yes. That's what it, that's what it appears to be. So Alex is vigorously no. shaking her head no. So I want Alex to 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 speak. Yeah, I mean, unless, unless Josephine tells me otherwise, we have um, double pane windows and we don't have window overhangs, but those were two energy conservation measures that were identified. It's to possible add-ons. Add yep. To further reduce our EV. There you go. Yes, and the sustainability committee recommended them as alternates if we had additional money. Hey, right, good, money. good, thank you. All right, that's very, very, very helpful so that no one is confused about this. Uh, are there things that are shown on this chart as rejected uh, that people would like to query or things that are shown as possible that people would like to query? Yeah, Christine. Um, yeah, Ken could just describe what happens on item eight when you change out the sawtooth roof for skylight. Is that flat? And are they still expensive? And what happens if you didn't do that? I'm just asking. Yeah, I'm going to punt that one to the architect. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ken. I don't play in those, in those waters anymore. <laughs> right, so the discussion here was basically if we had removed the sawtooth roof that we would go with um, something more unitized. So it would be standard. Um, skylights, but um, one issue with that is the MBLC um, really dislikes skylights and they constantly recommend not to use them. Um, so there's a little bit of a battle with that one, but um, the, the library footprint is very large and so we would still need to look at how we can introduce light in some of the inner portions of the, of the library footprint. Um, so it's something that definitely would still need to be reviewed further down the road. But the idea behind that one was that they would be just unit, basic unit skylights that would be distributed. Thank Christine, you. Christine, that so, answer your question? Yeah, I just want to throw it back to you, Austin. So is this something that we, or the design set, like how do we go about figuring that out? And obviously as the architect, if we were work, and skylights went away, like, because they had to, whatever, would you open up bigger windows? Like, does this become a whole new process? And how, how do, are we gonna decide and then it goes and gets redesigned? Like, what happens? So it depends on what happens in the rest of this meeting. So uh, my hope is that what will happen in the rest of this meeting is that we, the, the building committee will reaffirm our commitment to see that this project moves expeditiously into the next uh, the next phase. That's why Ginny Hamilton pointed out, uh, if you will, the cost of delay to them. And we're gonna talk about the cost of delay to us. Uh, if, it, if we move into the next phase, as I hope we will, then it would seem to me that it would be appropriate for the design subcommittee to take a very close look at each one of these changes. Uh, but it would be very helpful at this point to know where the whole committee is pending, you know, a very close look. If there are things that people think that we are considering uh, cutting that shouldn't be, it would be important for the design committee to have heard that. And the reverse, if there are things that are in the reject column that we think we should consider. So I think, Christine, the answer is it depends on where we are at the end of this meeting. Thank you. Uh, George, is your hand up? It is. Um, item number 14, the concrete sidewalk in lieu of stone and granite, uh, that's listed as a possible. Uh, in my opinion, from a maintenance perspective, it just seems like a no brainer because we have concrete now and stone, granite and brick are so much more difficult to maintain, uh, particularly in the winter months. And given that we have so much foot traffic around the building, I just see that going with concrete as though, although it's not as beautiful, just makes more sense to me. Thank you. Thank you, George. Xander? Yeah. Um, I guess like Anika's question really, I think, speaks uh, a lot to where I'm at right now, which is. Um, 
to be quite frank, this spreadsheet is disparaging to me, not because anyone is uh, not done incredible work. Like there's an incredible amount of work, um, really inspiring and tough decisions that have gone into this. I think we're all facing a really harsh reality as a town, which is like, we've got a number of projects around town and it would be a shame if in a decade we looked around and said, and there is our 2022 skyline of compromises. Um, the type of decisions we're making right now are not the type of thing that we can come back to in a year of plenty and fix. Um, these are things that we're going to ingrain into the building itself um, and are gonna be long lasting. So for me, when I look at this, I guess like the question is what, given that we can maintain the goal of our programming here, what is the programming that we are gaining through making this project move forwards expeditiously versus uh, what are the things that we're ingraining into our skyline in order to maintain the programming we are already able to provide? And so I, you know, as someone who thinks a lot about going to the community, um, it is really helpful to me to think about this in terms of going forward with this project, what is the programming that we will be able to increase um, or provide that already we have a need for? Um, and therefore justifies making the sacrifices that, that we're not gonna come back to because the skylight is not gonna be something that, or the saw to youth roof, which is not something I entirely understand, is not something we're gonna come back to in five years and say, oh, we now have the money for. Xander, I'm not exactly, could you say more exactly about what, so uh, the, the renovation and addition, and you stop me if this is not responsive to your question. The renovation addition to the building, among other things, would enable the following things. We have a children's room on three different levels of the library. It could be on one level. We don't have a teen space. We could have a teen space. We don't have great reading rooms in the library. We could have great reading rooms. We don't have the technology that we need. We would have better technology. Uh, we had no plan for the Civil War tablets. We had a hope. So we'd be able in, to display these, uh, these treasures of the town. Uh, we would not otherwise be able to, um, to do that. We want to preserve the historical value and historical features of the library. We would do that. We want to make the library environmentally sustainable in a way the building is not now environmentally uh, sustainable. The library, the Board of Trustees undertook a very careful examination of the needs, the space needs, the program needs of, uh, of the library and came up with a, a building program that was designed to do the things that I've just uh, suggested. You, you all know that uh, maybe other than the public schools, the, the library is the most democratic space in the town. It's the space for the old and the young and the well-off and the disadvantaged and English language learners and native speakers of English. It's their space. Uh, and by the way, just what I just mentioned, we will deal with the problem of the special collections, which is run out of space. We can't, we can't take any more things into special collections. We'll provide adequate space for the English as a second language program in the library. So I don't know, what, is that what you were asking um, about the, the program and what the, what, what the program would realize uh, in, in the project, Xander? Yeah, I think that's, I, honestly, I couldn't have um, watched someone hit it out of the park off the tee that I was hoping to set up better than that, Austin. So thank you for that. Because I think uh, these discussions can be disparaging in terms of watching, watching a feature we had dreamed of not be affordable right now. Um, but I think it is an opportunity to also reconnect ourselves to the values of our teens will have a space for the first time, Yeah, right? And the reason why I was willing to join this committee and um, 
and B is because like I really do believe this is a conversation about centering our community. And so if we have to sacrifice uh, an element in order to do that, I think we owe our teams yeah. that um, yeah. and should be willing to do whatever is necessary, even as long as it adheres to our central values. And so I don't want to lose those. And thank you for reconnecting us to those. Well, thank you, thank you, thank, thank you for the, thank you for the question, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Um, so as I look at this, I, I, I don't consider any rejected um, until we decide that. I also look at every item that we do reject as being that much more money, we, much more money that we have to raise. So as we look at these things and we say we're rejecting that, it means okay, now we have to raise that two hundred fifty thousand dollars or whatever it is that we're looking at. So I just think we have to be super cognizant about the true costs of what these things are. And we have to start really differentiating between our wants and our um, needs. Um, so um, I think these, as Xander is a plant, these are really hard questions and challenges for us because we have our aspirations and then we have the sort of blunt reality of the, our financial situation. Um, I think our mission, my mission, and until, until it changes, is to continue building this plus the other three buildings in the town. Great. Um, so, but Paul, I think we have to keep all the tools on the table. Well, do you have thoughts now? And of course, you don't, you needn't, but do you have thoughts now about some of the things that are in the rejected column that you think uh, we ought to take a close look at and see whether or not uh, we we would uh, might imagine recommending that they be changed i mean i think my first cut would be like what what is you know what's our environmental responsibility in terms of sustainability uh you know MB, mblc says we don't like skylights is and that's i think we've talked about that a little bit that's a big number um you know is there a cheap, is there another way to get light, you know, natural light into the building, which is really important. Um, I, I haven't looked at these close enough. Um, you know, I'm, I think a lot of the things, the, the, the stuff, you know, on the ground, um, the concrete, that's always something we can go back and do differently, uh, but those are big number items. Um, yeah, well, we will have a chance. We'll all have a chance to weigh in more, but yeah. I, I do want to just, say that while I, I fully agree that the final say on these, any of these changes is gonna be where the building committee is gonna, that's our charge. All of these things were looked at very carefully yeah. with the idea that we didn't wanna come back to the committee and say, let's take the cross laminated timber out of the building mm -hmm. because we thought it would be very costly to the sustainability of the building. So every one of these things, not that they, not that they can't be changed, but was thought of in terms of um, what we want the building to be and what we thought was most essential to preserve. Um, and you're, you're right, we're aware of, and we haven't, uh, we haven't completed the conversation today about uh, what the cost implications might, might be. And uh, hope, hopefully at the end of the, this meeting, we will commit to continuing the design work and then we can weigh in on these particular changes. So, um, so then, then I would say on the rejected ones, I would wanna know which committee, was it the trustees or the our sustainability committee or design committee that said, we reject this, we recommend rejection of it, which I respect. I think you're right, Austin. I'm, I'm not looking to relitigate each one of these things. I just need to understand it before I can take a, a vote on this personally. Okay, uh, I got Sean, and then uh, Xander, your hand's still up. Are you? Do you want to come back in? Okay, not not hearing uh, Sean. Uh, you're next. Thanks, thanks, Austin. Uh, so this is a question maybe for Josephine or, or Sharon may know this. Do any of these um, reductions affect our ability to get historic tax credits? Um, I know that's a concern uh, that we've discussed briefly in the past. And so I don't know if some of these that were put into the rejected column were because of that. Yeah, Sharon, I don't know if you want to jump in on any of that, but my hand was actually raised just to point out that there are a couple of line items here that were probably posted as rejected before presented to you because we, um, Colliers and, and FA did go through these, of course, um, in detail. And 
one of those, um, Sean, that you had just mentioned, um, the line item number um, seven, standing seam middle roof in lieu of slate, I do believe that was pointing to, to the existing building. And so we wouldn't recommend going in that direction because we don't think that that would get approval. Um, so we just assume that that's just under rejected before we even presented that to you. Great, Josephine, your hand was up. Did you have anything else that you wanted to say at this point? Um, I was actually just going to comment on this, and there might be a couple of other items as as well that we could review um, afterwards, if you'd like, on the rejected list that um, probably wouldn't be an option at this moment to go back to if you folks will be reviewing this in more detail at a later could date. Could you just answer one question for me, and that's about um, item number 15, brick pavers instead of stone and concrete. Oh, that's the alternative. Okay, I got it. I, I, forgive me. That Ken Ken pointed that out. Okay, Christine. Yeah, if um, that would be great, Josephine, to get some clarification on the rejected ones. Um, so at the same time, I just want if no one's talked about the uh, value engineering items not pursued at the bottom. It if it's would be helpful. Maybe we should just hear why those. Um, were also rejected. And that I noticed there's no dollar amounts tied to those at all. Thanks. Ken? So I think some of these were uh, deemed uh, too, too detrimental to the project, specifically the elimination of the Gambrel roof, right? That's a, that's a design feature of the building, uh, the profile, the addition, the vertical walls, and the, all those things that um, were really impactful to the overall um, look and feel of the building, which I think would uh, may have a, may have uh, issues beyond the committee with possibly the MBLC or others that have been looking at this project with this again this Gambrel roof uh, reduction of the interior for, for, uh, finishes to expose the CLT um, that was uh, you didn't look at we didn't look at that further I think but because it would require additional costs to the mechanical systems to get them to be presentable if they were going to be in full view uh, with the with the CLT. So that was actually going to potentially be a net add um, rather than a rather than a cost savings. Uh, drywall with the wood cap guardrails around the floor openings in lieu of decorative metal. Um, that one I can't speak to. I wasn't involved in that conversation. I don't know if Josephine or Will was involved, but in similar with the reduction of the size of patios. Um, neither of those, I was involved with those conversations. So I'm not sure why those were pursued further. Josephine? Um, yeah, I could probably speak to the third one, but the last one, I'm not sure where we, where we landed um, with looking at more lawn um, as opposed, I think Craig did actually pull a number for that and I don't know where it ended. So maybe Will can chime in on that one. Um, and just the discussion to go back to number three, um, the drywall with the wood cap guardrails, um, that um, it wasn't a huge savings and it sort of um, takes us to a, a direction design wise that doesn't really go with what, you know, what we're initially thinking and, and yeah. the rest of the design of the building. So it's really um, detracting from, from our overall approach. So um, we didn't think that was an option. Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, Anika. So I have um, two, actually. So one is I'm curious about the skylights and what is the issue that the um, MLVC has or why are they not recommended? And also would any of the um, reductions related to um, sustainability affect any grants? Great, thanks. Awesome. Skylights, more detail on why MBLC doesn't like skylights. From Josephine. my understanding, I'll jump in and Ken, you can add to it if you'd like. Um, from what my understanding is that they've seen a lot of um, problems on other libraries um, with leaky um, and um, issues down the road. So it lasts for so many years and then they start to have issues um, with with leakage, so um, they, I don't know if there's more reasons, um, you know, further than that, but um, but that was the main thing that um, Andrea Bunker had explained to us in our last call. Yeah, that's, that's the way I understand it as well. They're just maintenance issues. 
Crystal. And as to sustainability and grant possibilities, Sharon, do you have anything you want to add at that point? Yeah, so um, it kind of goes with uh, Paul's question about um, the, the CLT and, and, and the sawtooth roof. It, it was discussed uh, by the Sustainability Committee, and they were very adamant about, um, about maintaining these uh, pieces of the project for the purposes of, of having a green building. Um, so I don't so I don't think that anything else that we are proposing here in the possible column uh, would put sustainability grants at risk. It's also the case, uh, Anika, I believe, though again, Kent would be the one to, that um, by, 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 right, we went to the voters with a particular vision of what this library would be. Um, um, among that vision had to do with uh, sustainability. And uh, there are two things. One is kind of keeping faith with what we presented at the time of the referendum, 65% more of the voters endorsed what we presented. And so I think what we are trying to do is as much as possible, keep faith with that vision. I can't speak, Kent might be able to speak to, if we were to remove the, some of these sustainability features, it might have an impact on the capacity of the capital campaign committee to raise funds. People might be just less disposed to wanna to put their uh, philanthropic uh, contributions to a library that was less sustainable. Does that answer your question, Anika? It does, thank you. All right, Xander, your your hand is up. Yeah, thank you. And I'm going to try and do a better job of putting it down. Um, the I'm just curious, given that we're all sort of stuck in the same place, right? Uh, I, I'm really curious, um, is there an opportunity to go back to the community and talk about increasing community participation. Um, so what specifically one option of that could look like is, hey, we are still really committed to these values, um, but we have to make these cuts unless there are people who can become more involved, right? And I think fundraising is one opportunity that we keep coming back to, but also <coughs> are there opportunities <laughs> Are there opportunities, for example, uh, the fact that we have built such great partnerships with people who are willing to uh, take the garden as it's being moved, right? To go back to them and say, hey, the rain garden is something that we don't want to cut. Is there a community partner who's willing to take on that right. cost or to volunteer right. some sort of services? Right. I think that's a great idea and one that we will certainly want to explore in all of its facets. I think that's a great idea. There may be things that we can uh, we can get people um, involved in helping us do. Alex. Um, yeah, I didn't catch all of Josephine's answer, so I apologize if I'm asking a question that you already answered. Um, so on the items not pursued, um, there isn't necessarily anything that bothers me in there that I would reject outright. I mean, the... The Gambrel roof was one of the designs that we looked at, but at the end of the day, it has to be signed off by Mass Historic. So I don't know whether, like, I'm just looking at those, those, uh, you know, reducing size of patios provide, like, <laughs> like none of those feel like they're taking away the programming for me. And I, I guess I don't super, super worry about the design because again, at the end of the day, it's got to, it's, it's gotta be approved by the Mass Historic. So I, I personally would be interested in knowing if there's some larger numbers in there and what that might look like. I may be alone in that, but. Josephine, did you wanna say anything at, at that point? Um, no, I think probably when we revisit this and sort of go Great. through the line items and you know the rejected versus the alternates and the possibilities, um, we could also further um, 
inform everyone on what these costs are and what that would mean and what it would impact, if, if that makes sense. Sure. Great. Thank you. Christine. So, but Josephine, I was going to ask a question, but are we going to do that in this meeting, go through each thing? Is that what she's saying or at another time? So I, I'm, I'm just going to make the, the, the suggestion here again. Um, I think what I hope will come out of this meeting is we're going to continue the design work. I believe that if that's what this committee decides, that the next step would be for the design subcommittee to convene and to look very carefully at these items. Uh, and, and at that point, we'll get more information. People have a chance to think about it and chew on it. Christine, is that answering the question? Uh, I think so. So okay. are we still asking questions about this or are we sort of sure. doing no, that no. and we're going to move to what you're talking about, like deciding if we're even going to dive deeper? If you have questions about anything here, it would be good to raise them because that will allow FAA and the OPM to think about them. Then I do have one one just quick additional one on sure. me. Um, so we see a savings if you like the sawtooth roof, um, which is great, and the issues with skylights, I can see that that would be a big savings. Um, could we also have the number just to dump, you know, at the next meeting, whatever, um, is what would be the savings if you, if you got rid of the sawtooth roof and you didn't do skylights and you just do a regular somehow roof and, and considering adding more window, whatever, are those elements to bring in more light? I think that would be a number that would be helpful. Um, is everyone saying whether it's the hard choice we make or is it, uh, I don't know, the community it really wants us to put the money into that? So Josephine, is that a number that can be like estimated or? Maybe Ken might want to jump in. Um, the bigger problem that we would see with that is just um, that because of the large footprint of the building, um, we only have so many exterior walls where we can bring the light in. So we have some central areas that, um, you know, might be of concern where it might be a little bit on the darker side than what we were anticipating. So we would have to probably study that, but um, that's something that we would have to consider and look at a little bit further if you're saying to eliminate the sawtooth roof and the skylights altogether. I think I understood you correctly, right, Christine? Christine? Right. Is there a third option in there or is it only go to skylights? But as you said, we know the MDLC and uh, hello with the Jones, don't we have problems with skylights leaking? But anyways, um, you know, is it just so we, you know, what does it mean? What are the choices and what are the dollar? Yeah, and I think we had floated this at some point in one of the um, meetings that we had together um, a few weeks back, but um, it could be that we end up um, doing, instead of many sawtooth roofs, we, we eliminate it and, and do one or two where it would bring in a lot of light. But again, that's something that we'd have to, you know, study or look at a little bit closer, but we can definitely um, touch base with Collier's, you know, after this and, and, and start thinking about some of those. I thought that the conversation about the sawtooth roof also had to do with the possibility of kind of passive solar in the building. Is that right? Yeah, so there's a couple of things that it's doing. Um, one of them is that it was providing um, a face for its solar panels yep. in the future. Yep. Yep. Um, and then the other, of course, is bringing all the daylight in. Yep. And that's part of why I think we said not to eliminate the sawtooth, sawtooth roof line. But again, we'll we'll revisit that. Uh, Can I ask a question, Austin? I'm sorry, sure. I don't know how to raise my hand. I, and I think that's you because I'm scaring my screen. But thank you. So this may be a really dumb question. But my question is, the items that we're putting in, let's say we say we're going to reject all of this. Can, can they go in the alternate? Can Does that cost us more when we go out to bid? Can? Uh, so it, it, I don't know if it necessarily costs us more. Uh, it definitely costs us in uh, design time because now we're asking the design team to, to, to design two different options, one the alternate and one the, uh, the base option. 
Uh, and then there may be, uh, if you have too many alternates in a project, uh, it sometimes is, um, is uh, a, a contractors get a little bit leery about that as if they think you're just um, looking for an a la carte menu and um, not That's really sure. That's pretty much what, what I'm looking for, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I understand now, thank you very much. Okay, any other questions about this? Because I want to ask Sharon to go on a little bit and help us to understand a little bit about the cost of delay and other kinds of questions. But before we go there, uh, Alex? Yeah, I guess I would just ask the design subcommittee um, when you're doing your review to now that I understand that question about alternates is, um, you know, we're going to achieve the EUI goal that we have with the current design and the triple pane windows and the overhangs are extra. So is that where we want our alternate to be focused and should it be focused elsewhere? And I just put that out to the design committee Great. for consideration. Great. Very, very good. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Sharon. By the way, before you do this, Ken, could you just say out loud, uh, well, no, I'll come back to you after Sharon finishes her thing, because what I want to do is to just make sure that everybody understands what we're talking about in ter terms of the uh, total cost of the project. If we make the kind of changes that we're talking about, uh, what would the total cost of the project be? Sharon, go ahead. I'm muted. I'm sorry. I'm going to hand this over to Ken and he's going to walk us through this next document. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So uh, we put together this uh, a couple of spreadsheets here to kind of outline some of the cost analysis that was done uh, and some of the questions that came up. Um, so uh, I'll just go through this very, very quickly and, and then answer any questions you may have. So one of the questions that came up was uh, there was a repair um, a report that was done um, a year or so ago by Coon Riddle, and there was a cost associated with those uh, repairs to the building. And so um, trying to compare apples to apples, what would that cost be if we're escalating that work up to um, start essentially um, today, if we were going to go forward with that project today? And so looking at the cost estimate and the options, uh, essentially escalating it to the present Option one would go from 16.8 million up to 19.5, and option number two would go from 14.4 up to 16.2 million. And that's using, again, similar um, uh, cost escalation that we've been seeing um, over the last year, and then projecting out based on some of the conversations we've been having with the estimators and just seeing how the market is, is moving along. Uh, so a significant change in the cost uh, there. Uh, another question that was asked is, well, what is it going to, what would it potentially cost us an escalation if we were to pause the project for a couple of months and understanding that right now, the range in the total project uh, budget ranges from 46.8 million to 53.3 million, depending again on where the escalation falls within that time frame. Uh, we're currently looking at an escalation of about 1% per month. And so the cost of escalation for those two months would, would vary between 726,000 to 1,066,000. Uh, a couple other items of note, uh, the cost to date for some of the soft costs, essentially just the OPM and uh, the design team ends up being about $401,000. The cost to bring the project through bid and to um, get through the bid process and get solicit bids from contractors, which would essentially take us from today to bid date is approximately $1.385 million. Uh, and that's again, just showing you what the, what the capital outlay would be between now and bid. But at that point in time, we would have concrete bids and no cost certainty at that point. Next slide, please. So some of the other things uh, that we want to make note of. So some of the effects of the delay, obviously we had uh, kind of spaced out the cash flow and the schedule to align as closely as possible to the MBLC grant disbursement uh, to make sure that we were 
trying to minimize the outlay of, of the town and try to utilize the MBLC's grant funding as, as in, in the best way forward. Um, by delaying, it pushes the MBLC disbursement number five from July 2025 to July 2026. So that's um, that's that's pretty significant and something that should be um, should be thought through. Then um, the, the cost reductions, which we've talked about, and we put them under plausible and not possible or rejected, because I think that's probably a better um, better way of describing it. We've talked about those already in big big numbers. The exterior finishes 460, interior 490, landscape about 697, which brings us to that 1.5 million dollar um, sub subtotal for that escalation. Again, uh, with the way that the market is moving and moving quickly, um, we've been having conversations with the estimators and not just our estimators, but other estimators and, and the market analysis that's happened over the last month since the estimates have been have been done. We think that there will be a market correction between now and the, uh, the, the date of bid. And so there are some assumptions and some thoughts about assuming that there could be an escalation reduction of about $750,000. Again, this is something that's plausible um, that, that could definitely happen based on what we're hearing on the market corrections. Then the FF&E. Um, so the furniture, fixtures and equipment, uh, the budget is currently 2.5 million. That includes not only your furniture, but your, uh, your book sorter and uh, all of the uh, stacks for the library. Um, after talking it over um, with the library uh, and um, the design team, we think we could probably reduce that number by a million dollars. <throat> it would mean we would forego the book sorter and some other things. Um, <laughs> But all told, that could get us a potential total cost reduction of about $3.3 million. And then over to the right-hand side, again, is the, the, the not plausible <laughs> cost reductions that we uh, talked about previously. Um, and so that's kind of the big picture cost analysis of, of how things are shaping out right now. Ken, just again, so everybody will have the figures in their head. If, if we reduce the cost of the project uh, by three point three million dollars the estimated total cost of the project would be what so with the deduction of 3.3 .3 million we would be looking at between 43 and 49.9 or just under 50 million dollars for total project costs right and the total project cost right now is the budget so the total is is 36 point, essentially 36.3 million dollars. 36.3. So roughly an escalation at the low end of about seven million dollars in cost. Um, and at the high end of about 13 or so million dollars in cost. Is that correct, Ken? That's correct. Okay. Uh, is there anything else on these slides or are we where we should be? Sharon, that's it for those slides? Yeah. Okay. All right. Any questions about the cost um, reduction conversation uh, that we've just had? I will say that in the trustee, in the meeting of the Jones Library Board of Trustees, uh, the idea of pledging the endowment uh, as against the backstopping of the fundraising uh, we thought it would provide assurance to the town on the low end of the of the cost of projections. We don't know where we're going to end up, but that was what our what our target was. We don't have a, the value of the endowment would not have covered the cost difference between the current budgeted and the high end. So that's part of why it's important to keep those figures in um, in mind. Uh, any other questions about the cost figures that we've now just seen? Uh, Christine, may I just say one other quick thing? I'm sorry, I should have said this. And of course, right now the library is pledged uh, up, up to about six million dollars of its endowment. Uh, that that's already in agreement with the town. So uh, the 
the cost of moving forward uh, more than $1 million to bid, to bid documents. And Ken, it would be really important for you to just say a word about your experience in what happens at the bidding phase, but the cost of going forward uh, to the bidding phase is, uh, again, hopefully is gonna be covered by fundraising and is backstopped by the existing pledge of the um, the uh, library's endowment, the agreement that we'd already had with the town. Uh, Xander? Yeah, I guess my question is um, for Paul, and I was just wondering if he could speak to what these conversations are looking like with the other major town projects right now. Um, are we unique? Are we in line? What's, what's going on? <laughs> It's not unique. It's throughout the construction industry. We're seeing it in the school building project as well. Um, you know, so, and I, you know, we're not that far along for, with the DPW or the um, fire to, but it's just prevalent throughout the construction industry. Um, so I don't think this is a surprise to anyone. It's, um, it's a, it's a shame that we weren't able to move forward with this a year ago when we, we could have, and that's, that costs us millions of dollars because of that. Um, but it's where we are today. So we're looking forward on how do we move forward at this point in time. Thank yeah, you. But I, but I think it's pretty, every every community and with any building project is looking at this for every one of their building projects. Yeah, and as was mentioned earlier, I think by Kent or Ginny, um, uh, that's part of why this letter from Deer, the Deerfield uh, people to the governor was so significant because it's put, uh, at least at the state level, a, a clear marker that this problem is not unique to Amherst. It's not a question of did we manage the project well or did we hire the right OPM. The same, pro the same problem is not only right Paul town wide but region wide, and it's affected every library uh, project that the MBLC is hoping to hoping to support. Okay, other questions or thoughts about cost. Christine, yeah. So I hear 43 to 50 million. And as a building committee, and when we're trying to decide what to cut or what to fundraise or how to fund this, what number, and maybe this is Ken who helps us, like, are we going to pick a number in the middle? Or And my other part was, I remember looking a few weeks ago, the contingency percentages were a little on the low side. Um, since we don't have those numbers to look at, are we still being very conservative and kind of low on that? Yeah, so one of the things, I'll answer the last part of that question first. So we did increase the contingencies slightly and escalated those up a little bit. But if you recall back when um, we put this before uh, the council, well, we did reduce uh, uh, several line items in that budget in order to get us down to that 36.3 million. Um, one of the things I will say is, um, and I mentioned this yesterday at the trustees meeting, historically, estimators estimate to kind of the middle range of the costs. Um, and so what you're seeing is kind of the, the low mid and uh, the low mid and high range between the 40, let's say the 46 and the 53 or the, the, the 43 and the 50. Um, so you know, our assumption is that we're, we're going to we're going to be driving towards that that 43 number. That's that's the number that, you know, we want to try to do whatever we can to, to get this down there. But without, you know, the like design still needs more time to cook. This is only schematic design level. We're making assumptions on uh, narrow nature. We will know more again as the design progresses. Into Ken, you kind of we, we lost you there. So you want to just repeat the end of what you said? Those numbers are, are going, but without 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 that, um, you know, we don't want to give you a specific number. The range is probably all we can do at this point. Okay, Christine, did that answer your question? Uh, it was kind of hard to hear him, but uh, so. We're just sticking with a range for now. So 
I mean, it's a pretty big range. So how are we supposed to ensure that we're on target? Ken? So I think at this point, we've got to, we've got to establish what we want to drive this down towards, right? If the estimators and the market's telling us it's, it's, it's this large range because they just don't know how escalation is going to fare, hopefully by the time we get to the next level of the design, the, the, we'll have a better handle of what the markets are doing and, and hopefully have a better handle on what escalation, how it's going to impact the project. So for, for, my, for my team's intents and purposes, we are, we are focusing on the lower end of that number and that's what we're going to be driving, driving the project towards. That's that's the intent is to do whatever we can to get us to that lower number. Christine, Just follow up. So you, you said drive, drive to the forty three. Um, how do we do that as a building committee? So we've, we've, we've got to make sure that the team, as we're going through the design development process again, the, the project has a lot more to happen and a lot more design to have between schematic design level and through design development. We're going to be working with FAA to make sure as we're as we're looking at those documents and talking through those details and talking through what's happening in this next phase of design, that the assumptions that they're making align with what we discussed at schematic design or are further driving down the costs of the project to us to, to get us down to where we need to be with that number. Thank you. I think that I think the thing that we need to face is uh, we've got to go further into this project to get a real answer to your question, Christine. And it, we may not get a, a, the, the, the final answer until we're at construction bids. That's why I think um, it's important for this committee to endorse the idea that we move forward with design development. Uh, understanding that there is some risk that the costs will you know, go in the wrong direction. So what we've seen is that there's already been a reduction in the estimated cost. Um, that's why I think it's important for us to go forward, real, realizing that we might spend the additional funds. Uh, and at, at construction bid, the town looks at its finances and we look at our finances and we said we can't, it, it, we can't make the numbers match. If we don't do that, if we were to pause, if we were to say, no, let's slow down. What we've just seen is that the costs are gonna go up. Um, it'd be very costly for us to, to say, nope, let's put this on pause. It would be costly, again, I thought Ginny did a great job in this. It would be really costly in terms of fundraising. We already have a problem. And the problem is that the fundraisers for this project, and it's no one's fault, have been, you know, it's been a, up and down process. The project is going forward. The project is not going forward. What Alex and Xander and Anika have demonstrated through the outreach, which I thought was just remarkable, is how much energy there is in the community for this project to move forward. People who were not so enthusiastic about the project come forward with these wonderful ideas. We've improved the project. Project has gotten better by virtue of the community outreach. So uh, I think you've asked exactly the right question, Christine, but as I understand it, that the final answer to that question ain't gonna come until the construction bids are, 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 are in. And what Ken said is we'll get closer to knowing it when we go through design development. But I think that, um, uh, that for all the reasons that Xander asked me to say, uh, the need for the renovation addition is as great or greater than it has ever been. And that's why I point to what we've already done. We've improved the project by virtue of the community's input and engagement. So I don't know that we're gonna be able to know the answer when that's what the trustees did, right? The trustees said, we can pledge our endowment and that will cover 
kind of dollar for dollar and actually more uh, than what, um, what the low end estimate is. And we were able to do that in part because we saw that the cost escalation has already been cut, right, by $750,000. Again, that's an estimate. So I think that's where we, I think that's where we are. And um, I, I think that's the, I think that's the question that we have to decide kind of right now. Um, do we say to the OPM and the architect, keep going? Uh, that would then enable us, right, Christine, to get the design committee to get the design subcommittee together and look carefully and review all of those things. So, um, I mean, we all want to get this thing built, and it's about having enough money in the pocket to pay for it. Um, and I know the trustees, I watched the meeting yesterday, and, and you guys are really trying to put it out there, you know, to back it as much financially as you possibly can. Um, Paul, what's the thought with the town? I know there's incredible pressure with other capital projects. Um, you know, because what happens, I assume we take this big mortgage bond, whatever, and the town, is it the town that will guarantee it? So that, God forbid, it ends up 48 million. Like, does the town carry that? Like, I don't know. I, I, I guess I'm just saying, like, you got to have a plan, regardless of what the number is. And are all the players that have the money, are they on? I, Sean, I don't know. Go ahead, Sean. So one scenario for how it could work is if we wanted to go to construction. Um, I don't know exactly the wording of what was voted last night. So I think Paul and I still need to sit down and look at that and, and think about what that means. Um, but one scenario would be to continue to construction bids so we can find out the exact number. Um, and that would that would kind of mitigate the, the range that we're looking at. If at that point, um, if at that point, you know, it's a big number, then obviously we have to make a decision what we do if it's something that uh, we have the funds for, then we could proceed. Um, the, 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 so with what the trustees, my understanding of what the trustees did last night would be if we get to that point and decide we're not moving forward, they would cover the cost that we're gonna incur over the next three phases or two phases of the project. Um, Cause I think for Paul and I, the, the decision is, can we put more town, um, taxpayer funds out there not knowing if we're gonna to get to a final project? Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, Austin, my understanding of what was uh, what happened last night was that the, the endowment will basically ensure that if we don't move forward, they would cover that cost um, so that we're not putting any more taxpayer funds uh, potentially at risk there. Um, so, so Sean, if I can just be clear, cause I think there's been, I think there's a little confusion, which I just wanna make sure that we're not confused about. The trustees and the town signed an agreement. We've already pledged much more than the $1.3 million that would be required to cover uh, the additional cost to the bidding phase. That's done, that's signed, sealed, and delivered. That's there. What the trustees did last night was to say, we are willing to increase the, pl the pledge of the endowment and, right, not to take the amount that's already been contributed as a reduction from that pledge. But but that pledge of the of the more of the endowment, I don't think has a huge amount to do with between now and the bid, bidding document, the, the, the bid phase. That's already been, in my view, but I, again, stand to be corrected, that's already been done. The town has got that agreement. There it is. Yeah, so I think the details, again, that's why I say we have to look at the details. So my understanding of that pledge is, is we have a successful project, we move forward, if the fundraising falls a little bit short, the endowment makes up that difference. This is slightly different where we get to the construction phase, if we decide we're not going to move forward, um, well, the fundraising is sort of, I, you know, I don't, most donations, I assume, are for a project to occur. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily be for the fundraising to fall, if the fundraising falls short at that point, it would be how do we just cover the cost of the, the project to that point in time? Um, so that's where I mean, we have to step Good. back and look at the existing Good. agreement, what, yep. what it describes as it relates to that piece of it, 
And then if there's additional amounts, were there any additional um, uh, contractual language around what was just done last night? Yeah, I think probably that makes sense. And I think that uh, that you and Paul and myself and Sharon should sit down and look at the agreement, that probably the town's lawyer should look at the agreement. And that we'll see what it, what is what it what is there because we do want to make sure that we're all on the same page in understanding where that agreement is. There was no vote taken last night other than the vote to pledge the um, in, you know the value of the endowment. You heard the what 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 the motion was right. The motion was to uh, enter into conversation with the town with the view of um, agreeing to pledge the value of the endowment against the completion of the project. Right, so I think the, again, that wording, if it's completion of the project, I think we would have to go back and revisit um, and, and take a look at what that, again, what that would mean if we get to construction bids and uh, the, depending on the outcome of that, what happens. Yeah, well, this is right. So we, we wanna get there together. This is a question of also, right, what the town, what, what the town wants to what the town wants to do we're gonna we're gonna try to help get there but this is this is a, a question where the town wants to do whether or not the town thinks that that we should go forward the trustees think that we should go forward I hope the building committee in a minute will recommend that we go forward but we'll, we'll see Alex thanks so um I don't know if this is, I'm, I feels like this is a little bit outside of the purview of this committee, but I, it was in the presentation. So um, I just had a question. The repair estimate that was escalated is a slightly different number than we saw um, yesterday. But then also a comment was made that it was escalated to begin the project today. Um, and the repair estimate is just that a repair estimate? There's no actual design work. So we, so I guess I wanted to clarify that because you know, as Christine is talking about where money comes from, you know, we do know that that entire 16, 18, 20 million, whatever that number is, is coming from the town, um, and and we don't have the same fundraising potential, state grants, sustainability grants, et cetera, available to us. Um, so I guess I just wanted to take a second to understand what you meant when you said escalated to, for the project to begin today. Is that design work starting today? Or? Yeah, so I think there still would be have to be a fair fair amount of design work done to at least document what the repairs need to be, right? I think that's- All, all the design work. There's no design work that's been done. It literally was taking an estimate. We, we, the library, put together the things that were most critical and must be repaired. George can speak to that. He's the one who put the list together. And then we requested an estimate for that repair. And then Kuhn Riddle, um, because we would be triggering, once we work on the HVAC system, essentially, we're going to trigger accessibility requirements. And that required a designer to help us get to that number because there was design work relative to the accessibility portion. But to move forward with a repair, we are starting from scratch in terms of the design work relative to the repair. So if we're looking at numbers that are escalated with a project to begin today, that's not realistic. Um, not to mention the fact that I'm guessing the town is likely not going to write us a check for $20 million for us to start the yeah. project tomorrow. No, we, we, we figured this project was going to start in 20, at some point in 2023, and that's what it was escalated out to. With it, okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Alex. Xander. Um, also slightly outside of the purview of this committee. Uh, I just wanted to say like, um, is to be quite blunt, there still is not a contract for our teachers in town. Um, and the current proposal is woefully under the cost of inflation. Uh, and so it's not just us who is trying to figure out how to come up with money that isn't there. Um, and so I, 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 wanna, I want to highlight the organizing opportunity or engagement opportunity um, that I think as we talk about this going into the future, 
there is a growing tension right now about the town spending money on all these capital projects while they're not maintaining the people in their buildings. Um, and my words, not theirs. Uh, and so I just want to signal that there might be an opportunity for us to engage our educators, many of whom are so deeply connected to our library, uh, as an opportunity to talk about as we go, if we go forward with this project, um, what that means monetarily in terms of all of us figuring this out, uh, because I think there's a lot of great ideas and, and opportunity for engagement there as well. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so I think that the agenda of this meeting is really now to decide what we say to the architect and the OPM. So as I understand it, what the architects are ready to do is to enter into design development. There might have to be some revision to the schematics, Josephine, is that right on the basis of the cuts that we are talking about? That is correct. It depends on how you want to proceed with those alternates and when, where we, we would be starting with the design. Right. But the hope is to make those changes and to go into design development. Is that right? Yes. So that's it. Yeah, Sean. Um, so I, if, I don't want to jump the gun, but if um, if the thought is to go to a vote, I just I think it would be a recommendation to the town manager to uh, tell FAA we would go to the next step. So our contract with FAA um, or our potential contract with FAA, uh, the town manager is the uh, determining body basically to move from one phase to the next. I think that's very helpful. I'm sure the town manager would be very interested in hearing from the members of the building committee if he considers what it is that he wants to do. And he will be very interested in hearing from the 65% of the vote. Oh, I'm not, I, I, that's going beyond the the moment. So let's see whether or not we can um, uh, we can frame a motion to make a recommendation to the town manager. So I think the motion would be that we recommend, the building committee recommends that the, uh, uh, the work on the Jones Library building project continue. And we would understand that it's continuing means that uh, we would go forward to look with the design subcommittee to come forward with recommendations to this committee, again, to finalize changes that would have, have to occur in the schematics. And they would go forward with that work. And then uh, unless they were told differently, they would go forward with design development. So the motion would be that this committee recommends to the town manager that uh, the work on the Jones Library building project be continued. Is there is there a second to that motion? Second. OK, is there a discussion of the motion? Austin, can you just clarify, if we discontinue the work on the Jones Library, we are returning the money or we are suspending the work and pausing? Uh, I would assume that if we vote, no, we don't want to continue, that the conversation would then have to occur, where are we? Now, I think that Sean rightly pointed out that, that we, the town manager, Sean, myself, Sharon, the lawyers need to look at the agreement because we're all in agreement that we want to provide whatever assurances the town um, needs. But uh, I, I think that if you vote no, you're voting to pause the project. Christine. Um, I just wanted to, so if we move forward, um, I just want to confirm the amount of money that is sort of like at risk or like would have to be made up. And I think that from the slides that I think Sharon had up is the professional fees today to bid date, which is a total of about 1.4 million. Is that the risk? Like that's what we're talking about. If we keep going, it's that amount of money that would have to be covered. If we go all the way to, to the bid phase which isn't that what we're sort of hoping to do right now. That is what we're hoping to do. But of course the town manager could say, yes, we're gonna continue and then come back to us and say, well, no, we wanna stop later on. But 
uh, yes, that's what you were showing to be about $1.3 million from here to the bid phase. And then there was on the slide, it said pause for two months. It gave this range from 700,000 to 1 million. That would be the increased cost of the project if we would have just stopped the, the, all the work for two months. But so that's what we're voting on, right? That's whether or not we pause for two months or not. We're voting to recommend, uh, the motion that was made and seconded is to recommend to the town manager that the work on the Jones Library building project continue. That's what the that's what the motion right. is. Christine, you just countering like can you hear me? I can now, yeah. Yeah. So I'm just confirm like because we just said if we say no to this motion, that we have to ask where are we or whatever. But part of that, where are we? wasn't there enough because you all talked about this a little bit yesterday at the trustee meeting is it uh, is the next option a two-month wait which we also heard our opm and our uh designer say they would they were good with that but i'm just i heard things talked about yesterday at your meeting and uh, we can pause the project we could decide to pause the project for an hour two months is um is a kind of arbitrary uh, number that we that we were working with. I mean, we could say pause the project for a month, pause the project for a week. So the two months that were it's in those slides, uh, you know, it's just a figure that we chose. Let's see what would be what would it be. But again, you saw that we can tell you the cost per week of 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 pausing. So that's not really an option. It's just go ahead or. There's, the option is to do whatever this committee wants to recommend to the town manager. Uh, we could recommend to that we could vote down this motion and recommend to the town manager that the project be paused for a period of time to be determined by, and then say who it's going to be determined by. That's what I was just asking because it was on the yeah. spot. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I got Xander, and then I got Anika, and then I got Sean. Xander. Um. As much as I love deciding things, uh, given the the this committee was, you know, the the voters passed one budget, we're in a very different situation, as acknowledged. Um, if we are, want to defer to the town manager to say this is a town priority, is that a vote to pause because we need to flip it back to Paul or can this committee vote to go forward? But the communication is that the town will stop if we exceed what the town is doing. Paul has the decision. So we can recommend that the work continue and Paul can say, I don't accept your recommendation. Uh, so that's what Sean was reminding us about, that all we can do is recommend to the town manager. And when I, when I said what I, said about i'm sure he'd be interested in what this committee has to say i meant that because this committee was designed to include people from the community the trustees uh it was designed to be kind of i don't know not representational exactly but to be inclusive and uh i i think it's really important that people on the committee make clear what it is that they want to say to the town manager a town manager can decide he doesn't want to go forward. He wants to pause. He didn't inform us. He'd say, I've decided that I, I can't accept your recommendation. We need to make this decision or that decision. We need to pause for a period of time. Did so that, that help? Uh, that, I, that's very helpful. But can I propose that one of the options is that we make no recommendation um, because it is the town manager's decision ultimately. Because I think saying we pause is going to send a message to voters, saying that we move forward is sending a message to voters. Um, but at this point, this for me personally, this is a conversation about larger town priorities as well. And so, like, we defer to the larger town to set those priorities, I think is a, you know, 
we send no recommendation other than all of the input that we've had at these meetings already. Uh, again, the committee can can uh, can do whatever it wants to do. If if someone wants to, um, uh, I, I think procedurally what we would do, Xander, is uh, that amendment would not be an amendment to the motion. It would be a different motion. So I think if you want to make no recommendation, if the committee wants to make no recommendation, then the committee would vote against the motion that I've just made. And we would say to the town manager, there's no recommendation one way or another. You, you, it's, it's, it's in, in your lap. And I, I, uh, isn't it a good thing that I studied parliamentary procedure in high school? No. Okay. Anika. So uh, this may be repetitive, but I want to be clear. Um, am I wrong in that it seems to pause? Well, to pause and to proceed would be a similar financial risk. Yes, if we pause and then decide to proceed, it would be a greater financial. I mean, we got to escalate the cost of the project. If we pause and then decide not to proceed, uh, then the 1.3 that we would have spent between now and the building would the uh, the construction documents the bid phase would not would not would not occur. Okay. Sean. Yeah, I mean, I sort of I kind of agree with Anika that um, one thing I've learned the last five to ten years is that pausing is never good. Nothing good comes from pauses. Um, but I do think there's, given what happened last night and just the magnitude of this decision, there's a level of due diligence that the town manager and others need to kind of think through. Um, so again, I wouldn't be in favor of a pause, but I do think we need a week or two longer to kind of get our arms around this and make a, a, a the best decision we can make. Uh, I think we have, yeah, I, I think that's exactly right, but I don't know that it's, there's any reason for the building committee the question about the financing of the project, how it fits with town priorities is beyond our jurisdiction. We're, we're focused on the building and the town manager in conversation with everybody else, anybody else he wants to, uh, will make, we'll, we'll make, we'll make, we'll make a decision. And if people feel that we don't have enough information to recommend to the town manager that we continue, then they can vote against the motion. Is it okay if I quickly respond, Austin? Uh, it depends on whether you're going to agree with me. <laughs> I'm not going to disagree, but I, okay, um, then go ahead. <laughs> um, but then I might be disagreeing. Um, so, you know, one thing I'll say is that our OPM, again, who's supposed to represent us, who, who I think has been representing us well, yeah. um, one of the things they strongly recommend, and they said it last time, was that we don't advance until we have a, a balanced budget, essentially, until we have a funded project. They said, don't move from one phase to the next phase. Um, until you're at that point. So I think, again, that's part of the due diligence and, and work we need to do is how do we make sure we have that before we go to that next phase? My understanding actually was that the OPM said something slightly different at the last meeting. He said that is our general recommendation, but the OPM is here to remind us which one of us has the clearer recollection. Well, Craig was yeah, one of generally... us, so I don't think Ken can. <laughs> No, oh, so I think I think it was Craig that mentioned that uh, a couple of meetings ago, and, and generally that is true. Uh, with everything being equal, we would absolutely look to try to do that. But the times being what they are right now, and the fluctuations that are happening in the market, uh, and the potential for corrections that are also going to be happening in the future, it's our recommendation that we continue forward. And we've been telling all of our clients this to get to a bid and to get bid certainty because we don't know what's going to happen at the time of bid when the general contractors actually take a look at this. It could be favorable market conditions at that point and we come in under budget. It, it, we, don't, we just don't know. And so it's it's our opinion based on where we're seeing these numbers coming that we can march forward. Thank you, Ken. Xander, I don't, is your hand uh, up still a, a residual or do you have another different question? I didn't, I do have a different question. Um, Ken, I'm just curious, I heard you talk about how there's uh, you expect and I was 
I love the optimism of there's going to be a market correction and therefore <laughs> things are going to get better. Um, but now I'm hearing, but hurry up and get to a, you know, bid certainty because we think things are going to get worse. And I'm just curious how those two things align. No, I didn't say things were going to get worse, Sandra. What I said is that escalation is a known factor. It's always going to happen. So the longer you wait, the, lo the, the more escalation is going, to, is going to happen, whether it's 4% like it normally is, or the 7 to 12% that it is right now, escalation is, is going to be a factor um, on this project moving forward. And so the, the, the timing of this project is such that we're anticipating that there's going to be a, hopefully a slowdown and a market correction on the escalation as we get closer to bid date and that the, that the escalation more closely aligns with how it typically is. But if we go beyond that, it's still going to be 4% compounded annually. There's still going to be uh, additional costs to the project. Okay. Uh, Christine and then Anika. Christine. So, um, I, of course, want to vote to just keep moving forward, but I feel that I'm still missing some information that there's conversations that still have to go and happen within the town, um, within with the trustees in the town, and we have the town manager and the financial person on this board and like are, I don't even know how they're supposed to vote on this when they know they have to go collect more information. So I know we're all like, have to hurry, have to hurry. How long does it take for those meetings and the town to figure out the rest of it? Like, can we delay this a few days, a week? Like, do we have to do this right now? Just wondering. So I'll just say, no one has to do anything right now. Uh, if the if if this motion is defeated, then the question is, what do we want to say to the town manager? Anika. Yes, yeah, so uh, Christine actually asked my question and and further. Um, so this would be for both um, Paul and and Sean, what real how much time realistically or, you know, is there a timeline that you feel that you would need to uh, review everything that you would need to to feel more uh, to feel confident about making a yay or nay decision. Paul, yeah. So I mean, we'd want to have that conversation about the agreement between the town and the trustees. That's the key discussion. Uh, what kind of funds are we putting at risk if we if we continue to move forward? I think our the facts we have is that we have a vote of the people, we have the vote of the trustees, we have a vote of the council, all saying we want this project to move forward. And that's uh, that's my operating principle. Um, the devil is in the details um, in terms of, you know, we've had some mis you know, some conversations. I think that can happen if, if the building committee um, says we want, we think it should move forward, that's something. Um, but the, the discussion with, how we are funding the next phase and how we're going to fund the phase after that the building thing is pretty is crucial we have two we have a lot of uncertainty right this moment um but we do need to have um clarity before we put additional town funds at at risk and what i'm understanding is that trustees are saying we've got you on that and i want to make sure that that's clear and that's that's what the trustees are saying, and that's something we we need to make sure we hammer out the language on what that really means. In my in my perspective, Paul, would it be helpful to you? I, I spoke for you, and I shouldn't have. I assumed it would be helpful to you to know the disposition of the building committee at this point. But I think. I, go ahead. It, it is. It's very. This conversation right. actually has been very useful. I think the building committee is taking a, their sort of responsibility very seriously and sort of really taking on the full uh, mantle of what it means to move this project forward. And I think that that's really important and, and a credit to the town. Um, I think what I'm hearing from building committee members, and I would abstain on this vote because it'd be, you know, yeah, recommendation to you. <laughs> yeah. What What do you guys say to you? Um, I don't listen to myself myself anyway. Um, but I think that it's, um, you know, I think the, the committee members are actually struggling in, with, as they, we look at the full project, how do we, how are, there's some discomfort there, I think, is what I'm hearing from members of the committee. Well, we haven't heard from all the members we of have the not, committee. Right. So if if we want to hear from all the members of the committee, let's hear from all the members of the committee. There is a but, vote on the table, you're right. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a way for people to express themselves. Sharon? Yeah, so I, I want to say, so we, the Jones Library Building Committee, we're not going to have any more information in two days or two weeks. We have all the information that we need. Paul, on the other hand, uh, you know, he and Sean, that they have a different job to do. They're the ones who have to look at the bigger picture. It's not our job. Uh, so I respectfully disagree with Xander. Um, it is our job to look at what is best for the Jones Library building project. That's our focus. Um, regarding timing, I believe it is important that we, as the Jones Library Building Committee, make this vote to tonight, approve this tonight, and then it can pass over to Paul, and he's going to take as much time as he needs to work out with the town attorney and, and with the library trustees to make sure that all the ducks are, are in line, which I believe they are, and, and he will come to see that as well after he does his research, and, and then he can move forward. If we just wait a couple more weeks, then we're just adding more costs to the project. Thank you. Okay, does anybody else want to speak to this motion? Al Alex, and then Xander. Alex? Um, two thoughts. One, um, again, I, you know, I said this in the trustee meeting, and I, delays concern me, right? A week, two weeks. I mean, every time, like you said, we can, we can break it up by, you know, cost that we're incurring per week. Um, you know, the trustees voted to move forward. And, you know, for me, I'm looking at this again, you know, as the chair of the buildings and facilities committee, if this project doesn't go forward, then, you know, <laughs> this doesn't go away for us, right? Um, and so for me, I'm looking at, you know, a project where the town costs are set, assuming that we all come to an agreement, at 15.9 million and the onus is on the library who has the best fundraising team possible, a campaign uh, you know, committee that's doing outstanding work. We have our state and federal le uh, legislators 100% behind this project doing anything and everything we can. There's ARPA money still available. There's, you know, there's, there, there is a pot of money that exists right now on the state and federal level that won't exist likely forever. Um, and my biggest concern fiscally is that we don't move forward with this project. And that means one of two things are going to happen. The town is going to wind up with a larger bill than they have right now, and or the library is going to slowly fall apart because we can't, we can't sustain and stay open right now. And our buildings and facilities committee meeting today, um, you know, our head of facilities said our number one problem is our HVAC system, which is the most expensive component because it is the thing that prevents us from opening. If we can't be open the hours we need to be open, we don't get state funding for our library services. So there's this whole cascade of effects. And I think, you know, if you're not living and breathing the actual maintenance issues of this library, the way some of us <laughs> who are on the library are, I think sometimes people forget or don't fully understand the magnitude of the issues that we're dealing with at the library. It's not a matter mm -hmm. of, yes, our carpets need replacing, but that's, you know, that's not the issue, right? The issue is our ability to stay open and to provide services. And I don't see us being able to do that into the future without significant funding from the town. So I, while this number is scary to me, I feel like we couldn't have a better team to raise it. I would like it to be smaller. Um, but fiscally, I think we will be in more trouble by not proceeding because, you know, as a library falls into disrepair, donations go down, right? You know, our annual fund decreases as the library gets shabbier and shabbier. And the, and the town has got other projects. We all know they have other projects. So for me, proceeding into design as quickly as possible to keep our costs as low as possible is a priority. And it is, for me, fiscally irresponsible not to proceed. It's a leap of faith. It's scary. I'm terrified of it. I'm not going to lie. But... I feel like I understand what the consequence of not going forward is. And I think it's a bigger cost to the town in the end and a bigger cost to the library. Thank you, Alex. Xander. 
Um, I want to just really like commend the discussion that's happening here because I think people are being incredibly responsible both to the project that we are tasked with and the community that we live in. Um, I mean, in full disclosure, I work in a school. The reason, Paul might remember this, but when I first talked about joining this committee, like the reason why I was interested was because I had a student who, when they could not be in school, went to the Jones to find a safe place until they could wait for their ride to show up because the Jones was the space that they Xander, you're, Xander, you're, Xander, you're breaking up. It's very hard to hear you. And so when I talk about like, we owe our teens a safe space here, um, I also, uh, thank you. Um, so like, I, I really appreciate all that, but I also know that when monies are being spent by the town, an institution where they're repairing, like it's not even one of the four big projects, they're repairing a giant track and it's 20% of our budget. Um, I do not feel comfortable with the fact that taxpayers voted to pass this, had input on this, and we are citing that as enthusiasm for the project all before the additional cost that we are now looking at. And so in terms of informed consent, I don't think I can go back to the other members of my union, to the members of my school community and say that the problem that originally brought me here is student coming to the library because they uh, couldn't be at school in that moment is going to be diminished by this project. I actually worry that it is going to be exacerbated because of the fact that we're going to be spending money that we don't have and it's ultimately going to come out of other places that aren't being as responsible for things. And so I actually think it is politically wise for us not to be sending any recommendation to Paul and let the town do that messaging and that work that this is a priority, because I do believe that they see this as a priority, um, but that doesn't need to come from us. I think that needs to come from them. And so I would vote against us having any recommendation to Paul. I believe it is for the town to do and recommend that this project goes forward without any pressure from the library committee itself. Thank you, Xander. I just wanna make sure that I'm saying the right thing. At the low end of the, the estimate, based on what the trustees voted yesterday, there would be no increased cost to the town. At the low end of the estimate based on the conversation that we had about cuts and the pledge of eight million dollars in the endowment assuming the endowment, endowment could go down endowment could go up there would be no increased cost to the town okay other other voices are we ready to vote oh sorry christine christine you're muted so we're voting right now. Will we vote again on this in a month or after we get more information and we actually go through cuts and costs and we're voting to, to recommend to the town manager that the project continue. And when the town manager makes up his mind uh, that the project can continue, then we will go forward with the work. At some point later on, if there's something that comes up and it appears that we can't go forward, then this committee will confront that and make a recommendation to the town manager. So it's weird that Paul, you're here, but so if Paul comes back and says, we have concerns, we don't think this can happen or the number's too big, we gotta get the number down lower or whatever he says, then we'll just go at this again, sort of. Like what happens if the, if final, the, the manager comes back and says no? 
the I think if the town manager comes back and says no, then the town manager will have thought about what all the contingencies are. And if he says no, we're not going to go forward. We'd like to know like why and what does that mean? And is he recommend? Is he saying we're pausing? Is he saying we're not going to go forward at all? Alex Lefebvre just indicated yet again that this is not a we either we either go forward with this project. Or we just keep the library as it is. So, so will the town? I assume, Paul, you will do this. You're also going to be weighing, like, if you said no, what that means for the library and the maintenance and still renovating, and you'd come back with some kind of plan or recommendation. And is it only from you and your town hall people, or does town council get involved in this at all? Because as it has to do. Paul? So the contracting authority is the town manager, uh, as long as it's within the appropriation that's been provided. And so that's the, at this moment in time, that's where we are. Thank you. Okay, are we ready to, are we ready to vote? One of my friends says at this moment, everything that has been, everything that can be said has been said, but not everybody has had a chance to say it. So is there anybody else that would like to weigh in now? Okay, let's proceed to a vote. So vote, the, mo the motion is to recommend to the town manager that the work on the Jones Library building project be continued. Sharon, how do you vote? Yes. Christine, how do you vote? Yes. George Hicks, Richards, how do you vote? Yes. Sean. Abstain. Uh, Anika. Yes. Uh, Alex. Yes. Xander. No. And Austin votes yes. And I abstain. Oh, I forgot to call on you, Paul. All right. So um, I don't know if anybody was actually keeping track of that vote. Sharon, Angie, were you keeping track of the vote? I yeah. did. Okay. Yep, I so, did. So would, would you just remind us what the vote was? I see one, two, three, four, five, six yeses, two abstentions, and one no. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. I want to um, just say, as Xander said, I really appreciate the conversation and the concerns and the thoughtfulness. This project already is a better project than it would have otherwise been because of your um, involvement. And uh, I think that this conversation reflected that very thing. So thank you very much for your thoughtfulness. I think we have a, a question of scheduling our next meeting. So I think we should go forward and schedule it for a couple of weeks from now. Is that, does that work? That would be on, um, on uh, the 6th of July. Does that work for people? Right, 6th of September, I am thinking backwards. The summer is slipping away. Paul? I, I will not be in town that day. Well, we need that, you. That's the Tuesday, right? Yeah. Yeah. We need you. So um uh would the thirteenth uh work for everybody at um could we meet at four o'clock on the thirteenth? Uh, uh, uh Alex. Yeah, I, I just have a question um in terms of procedurally. Um and Josephine, tell me if I'm not understanding correctly that can can you start the work or does the design committee need to make a recommendation on the cuts, which are then recommended to us, which are then approved? Like, are we adding? I'm just try, trying yeah. to remove as many weeks as I can from this. So, yeah. if, I mean, if that's the case and we are pausing three weeks for our next, you know what I mean? Like, I just, I, I want to meet like as soon as Paul's made his decision and design committee has met so we can just, Keep well, going. Times be going down, yep. not up. So. <laughs> Am I so, correct, Josephine? Do we need to? Yes, we would need to meet. We we can't start tomorrow. Um, that's correct. That 
what you pointed out, Alex, we do need to sort of reconvene. You folks probably need to meet and discuss how you want to move forward. We definitely need a couple of um, design discussions or discussions in general um, before we jump into the next phase. Could we do Thursday the 8th instead? Thursday the 8th. Uh, at 4.30, 4 o'clock, what are we talking about? Whatever you guys want. 4 o'clock on the, on the 8th? Okay. So I'm going to make a suggestion, and I appreciate what Alex said, and Paul, with your forbearance, I wonder if we can get the design committee together in advance of that meeting to, uh, you know, look look at the things. Uh, if we, you know, go forward, we'll be able to talk about those things when the building committee is next together. If we don't, well, it'll be uh, an, an exercise. Okay, so let's uh, let's plan to meet it on the eighth at four o'clock. Let's let. Um, Sharon and um, Angie and Christine put their heads together about uh, when the between now and then the design committee can uh, meet to dig in on the uh, the the, uh, the changes to the design. Okay, are we good with that? Excellent. Yep. I know of no correspondence. Uh, I know of no topics not anticipated by the chair 48 hours in advance. The next item is public comment and we have 11 attendees and I'm grateful for those uh, people uh, for your attendance. Uh, it's now your opportunity if you wish to make a public comment. Uh, I see two hands. So first, Bob Pam. Bob. Thank you. Um, I know. Bob, you, you, you didn't come through. Um, as you may know, I am one of the trustees of the library. I voted against proceeding. And I proceeded, I voted against it on the basis of my own analysis of what the <coughs> fundraising capabilities are. Um, that is not to say anything against the abilities of the capital campaign. I think they've been doing a wonderful job. Yeah. It is not to say anything against the, the folks who've been um, involved with this committee and similar committees um, on the design of the work. I think the the design work that had has been done um, is worthwhile and is useful. I think that <coughs> clearly needs to have major work done on it. My concern is that as the treasurer of the library and the chairman of the budget committee and the investment committee, um, it seemed to me that this was a risk greater than we could accept. And I would be Happy to talk about exactly why um, at any time that you want me to do so. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I see, uh, Ginny, I think you have your hand up. And again, we wanna just make clear before you speak uh, how grateful we are to you and the people on the capital campaign for the work that you've, um, that you've done. Ginny? Jenny, you're yeah, muted. I had there to get go. through the rejoining. Thank yeah. you, and, and thank you all. And um, I, coming back mainly to say thank you, and as a reminder that we are committed to raise these funds, and it is a challenge, and that challenge is going to meet the challenge um, that's necessary. So with, you know, to the point of the larger issues, um, by moving forward now and not adding cost escalations and getting us to bid numbers, as Austin said earlier, 
we then have an actual number to work with. The town does, the, the building does, and the Capital Campaign Committee does. So that gives us as the campaign committee, the urgency of this deadline or this milestone to motivate our donors. So within this next year, getting to bid phase gives us time to turn over every stone and look for those funds. And if we cannot, then we can, we'll say so then and be able to then give the town and the trustees an honest appraisal of whether or not we can make up this gap or whether we have to pull the plug on this. So moving forward now gives us the opportunity to realize what's possible. And there right. are milestones built into this um, to make sure that we can do so responsibly. So right. I thank you all for your deliberations right. and for all of this work. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to the results uh, going forward. Okay, any other, other member of the public wish to speak? Okay, so I think it's time to adjourn. Thank you all for your good, good, good work, and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks so much. Thank you.